7.3 integration with partial fractions. This is a continuation of our earlier video. In this part of the video we want to look at what happens when our denominators in our rational functions contain irreducible quadratic factors. Okay, and just to be clear, what I mean by irreducible quadratic, the quadratic x squared plus 2x plus 2 is irreducible, we'll say, over the reals, because obviously when I set this to 0 and solve, what I end up with is a pair of complex conjugates for the solution. Meaning if I was going to factor this quadratic, it would look like x minus negative 1 plus i times x minus negative 1 minus i. Okay, but we're concerned in this class only with real domains, functions over real domains. So in that sense, this is irreducible over the reals, not factorable over the reals. Notice the difference between this quadratic and something like x squared plus 3x plus 1. When I set that to 0, I get negative 3 plus or minus square root 9 minus 4 over 2. So I get negative 3 halves plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2, and those are real roots, meaning this quadratic is factorable over the reals. One of the factors would be x minus minus 3 plus square root of 5 over 2. The other factor would be x minus negative 3 halves minus square root of 5 over 2. Okay, so we're considering again this one to be factorable. And notice since this one is factorable, if I asked you to write 1 over x squared plus 3x plus 1 in a partial fraction decomposition, it would be possible to do that because this denominator is factorable into two linear factors. And we know that that would be possible, wouldn't necessarily be pretty, but there would be some constant term for the fraction whose denominator is x minus minus 3 halves plus square root of 5 over 2, and there would be another one for x minus the conjugate, negative 3 halves minus square root of 5 over 2. Okay, we're not really going to dabble in those kinds of quadratics. The one we're interested in talking about are quadratics that are irreducible. So like this x squared plus 2x plus 2 quadratic that we talked about above. Okay, so now that we know the difference and what we mean by irreducible, let's erase all of this and let's consider the rational function x squared minus 2x minus 3 over x minus 1 times x squared plus 2x plus 2. And the question is, what sort of partial fraction decomposition do I need for this? Obviously, it should at least contain partial fractions with these two denominators. And of course, we're saying that we can't factor x squared plus 2x plus 2 any further. Don't know where that 5 came from. So it would seem like this would be the basic construction of the, the decomposition. Now, we know what the numerator for this first partial fraction should look like. The question is, what should the numerator look like 
in that partial fraction with that irreducible quadratic denominator? Well, as usual, we try to figure out what this will look like if we combine these two into one fraction. And so we're looking for one fraction where this numerator will be identically equal to the combined numerator in those two fractions, which of course would be a times x squared plus 2x plus 2 plus this mystery denominator or numerator times x minus 1 all over, well, we're just looking at the numerator, so we won't bother with that. All right, question then, what should this missing factor look like? It would certainly seem superfluous to have too much here. And for sure, it looks like if I put a quadratic here, a quadratic times a linear would give me something that's third degree, which is excessive because I'm only trying to reach second degree. And notice one other thing when we look at the original function, the top degree, degree of the numerator is 2, degree of the denominator is 3. So this, this is definitely set up where we're ready for partial fraction decomposition. The degree of the top is less than the degree of the bottom. All right, so the question is, what would go here? Would it be enough for this just to be a constant? Well, if the degree of the bottom is 3, we know the degree of the top could be up to degree 2. And it is possible that this term could be contributing to, in some way, each of the different terms in this numerator, including the quadratic one. And obviously, in this term, that contribution is coming from the ax squared. So it does seem like we might be leaving something out if we did not consider the contribution, the possible contribution of that x minus 1 to all three terms, including the quadratic one. If that's the case, this missing term or missing factor would have to be at least linear. That way when I multiplied that linear b times the x minus 1, this would give me a quadratic. And that would account for the contribution to the overall quadratic term, which is that x squared, coming from both parts in my partial fraction decomposition. Okay, therefore, what I want for this partial fraction decomposition is x squared minus 2x minus 3 equal to a times x squared plus 2x plus 2 plus let's call it bx plus c because we just said we wanted to have at least a linear times x minus 1. In other words, in our original decomposition, we needed a constant term over that linear factor x minus 1. And now when this irreducible quadratic factor, which is degree 2, is introduced, the numerator should be degree 1 less than that. And that seems to make sense. When we had degree 1 factors, the degree of the numerator that got us where we needed to go was 1 less. It was degree 0, a constant term. Now we're saying if the degree of this denominator is 2, it will be sufficient to have the numerator be degree 1. That is 1 less than the degree of that quadratic irreducible denominator. So every time we end up with one of these irreducible quadratic factors, the partial fraction that contains that denominator will have a linear numerator a bx plus c. Okay, for our problem, and I'll rewrite it here on the next page, that means x squared minus 2x minus 3 over x minus 1 times x squared plus 2x plus 2. And just to repeat this, I will need 
two partial fractions in my decomposition, one for the linear factor, one for the irreducible quadratic factor. As usual, the linear factor x minus 1 gets a partial fraction with a constant numerator, plus another partial fraction whose denominator is that irreducible quadratic, but the numerator will now be a general linear expression, so bx plus c. Um, note, if either one of these factors was repeated, I would have to, because of the multiplicities, have multiple terms in the partial fraction decomposition. For example, if this was x squared minus 2x minus 3 over x minus 1 squared times x squared plus 2x plus 2, let's say also squared, then like we talked about in the last video, because the multiplicity of that x minus 1 factor is 2, I would have to have one partial fraction for x minus 1 squared. But since I'm building that out of a linear factor, the numerator need only be linear, or constant. Plus another partial fraction, where the degree on that is 1, so I'm doing both multiplicities, multiplicity 2 and then all the way down to 1. And now we're saying the same principle would apply to this irreducible quadratic factor there would need to be a, let's say, cx plus d for x squared plus 2x plus 2 squared, but then covering all multiplicities from 2 down to 1, I would need another partial fraction with x squared plus 2x plus 2 basically to the first, but I would need another numerator for that and it would have to take the form ex plus f. So again, linear, I need a constant numerator. Linear, I need a constant numerator. Quadratic, I need a linear numerator. Quadratic, I also need a linear numerator. All right, now, we'll do one of those here in a moment, but let's, uh, let's work on the one we've got which is the one where I have a single linear factor, a single irreducible quadratic factor, neither is repeated. Okay, so let's do our, our usual thing. And the first question might be, can I use the cover-up method here? Well, the answer is simple. I can certainly use the cover-up for this one, but you should observe that I cannot use the cover-up for this one. To use the cover-up requires what? It requires this factor to be 0 for some value of x. Okay, we know the only thing that makes this irreducible quadratic factor 0 is a complex number, which is out of our domain. So I'm not going to be able to use the cover-up on these irreducible quadratic parts. However, we can certainly use it for the x minus 1. And so how does our cover-up work? If I cover up the x minus 1 everywhere it appears, which we know we're getting that really by multiplying both sides by x minus 1, then of course the only term that will be left on the right side is a. What will be left on the left side is the numerator over that quadratic factor except again I need to evaluate that expression at the 0 for this x minus 1 factor and that's x equals 1. In other words I'm going to plug 1 into x squared minus 2x minus 3 over x squared plus 2x plus 2. Uh, that looks like what 1 squared minus 2 times 1 minus 3 over 1 squared plus 2 times 1 plus 2. So a ends up being uh, 1 minus 5 minus 4 over, looks like 5, a is negative 4 fifths. Okay, now, that does leave us, of course, two other coefficients to determine. 
And so now we proceed in the way that we did in all previous problems. I'm going to write that numerator x squared minus 2x minus 3, make it identically equal to the net numerator that results when I combine these two partial fractions, which is a times x squared plus 2x plus 2 plus x minus 1 times bx plus c, which means I have x squared minus 2x minus 3 equals or is equivalent to ax squared plus 2ax plus 2a plus bx squared minus bx plus cx minus c. Again, equating coefficients, if I look at the x squared terms, which would be these two, I can see that a plus b will be equal to the net coefficient on the x squared term on the left side of the equation, which is 1. Let me just pencil that in. So that means my first equation in my system will be a plus b equals 1. Let's do the same thing for the constant terms. I'm sorry, the first degree terms, which would be the 2ax minus bx plus cx. Okay, when I put those together, I have 2a minus b plus c. The sum of those first degree coefficients should be equal to the net first degree coefficient on the left side of the equation which is minus 2. So that makes my second equation in my system. And then of course I catch the constant terms, which would be 2a and minus c. And when I add those together, that should be equivalent to the constant term on the left side of the equation. So that makes my third equation 2a minus c equals minus 3. Now, even without knowing A, we could certainly solve this system from what we have right here on the page. But we already have a little bit of an advantage, as usual, because of the cover-up, I already know what A is. So from that, I could easily get B and C from those two equations without even using the middle equation. The first equation would say that B is equal to 1 minus A, which in this case is 1 plus 4 fifths which would be 9 fifths. The third equation says that C is equal to 2A plus 3, which would be 2, again, times A, which is negative 4 fifths plus 3. So negative 8 fifths plus 3. So negative 8 fifths plus 15 fifths, so 7 fifths. So it looks like we have a is negative 4 fifths, B is 9 fifths, and C is 7 fifths. And those are our coefficients, which means when I go back up to my original partial fraction decomposition, what we're saying now is that we can write the integral of x squared minus 2x minus 3 over x minus 1 times x squared plus 2x plus 2 as the integral of a over x minus 1 plus bx plus c, which is 9 fifths x plus 7 fifths over x squared plus 2x plus 2. Okay, let's continue that on the next page. Okay, I've cleaned up the integral a little bit, separated it into two separate integrals, pulled out the negative 4 fifths constant on the first one, so we know we're not going to have any trouble with this first integral. The question is, how do we handle 
the second one, and we've seen this kind of integral before, the first thing that you should probably be thinking about when you look at that denominator is that again, since it's a quadratic, I might be able to complete the square on it. If I could complete the square and get a denominator that has a form u squared plus a squared, then that's the one form for that sort of denominator that we know how to handle. We know that would go back to a tan inverse. Okay, the only problem with that, of course, is that for that to work, the numerator would have to be just a constant. And we've actually run into this problem before in another video. It's not the 7 fifths that's the problem. It's the 9 fifths x that's the problem. Now, the other thing you should be thinking about besides the tan inverse possibility is the possibility that u could be assigned to that complete denominator, which would make du 2x plus 2dx. And there is definitely material in that numerator to get 2x plus 2. So I'll just remind you, this is the trick we used the last time we ran into this sort of problem. I'm going to take that 9 fifths in the top. Let's factor it out. So, of course, that will lead 9 fifths times x plus whatever 7 fifths divided by 9 fifths is, which, of course, is 7 ninths. Okay, now why did I do that? because I can pull the 9 fifths out of the integral now. And the important part is the coefficient on that x term in the numerator is now a 1, which means I can multiply that x by anything I want. And what I really want is a 2. So if I multiply that by 2, of course, I can't just multiply one term in the numerator of the integrand. I have to multiply everything that's there. But if I multiply by 2, I'll have to divide by 2 on the outside. Okay, what does that give me? It gives me 9 tenths times the integral 2x plus 14 ninths over x squared plus 2x plus 2. Okay, again, what I want to see in that numerator is 2x plus 2. Okay, I can do that. I'll just write this as 9 tenths times the integral 2x plus 2 minus 2. It's our old add and subtract the same number trick. And of course, that gives me the 2x plus 2 that I want. What do I do with the minus 2 that I inserted to balance things? Well, I'll combine it with the 14 ninths. And of course, when I do that, I've got negative 2 plus 14 ninths is negative 18 ninths plus 14 ninths, which would be negative 4 ninths. So when we put this all back together, we've got 9 tenths times the integral 2x plus 2 over x squared plus 2x plus 2 minus 4 ninths over x squared plus 2x plus 2. Okay, if you notice what we've done here, we've separated it into two different types of integrals that are basic ones we know how to handle. And of course, the first one is very obvious. That one's constructed according to what we recognized up here, that the denominator, if made into a u, is x squared plus 2x plus 2, and the du would be 2x plus 2 dx, which is precisely what I've got in the top. So we know how to integrate this part. Okay, what about the other part? Well, the other part has just a constant in the top. And if it has just a constant, and we were able to complete the square, let's say on this part right here, then I would have a tan inverse form. And of course, if I complete the square on that, x squared plus 2x plus 2, I know the number I would have to add to x squared plus 2x to complete the square is 1, 
And since I already have 2, that would leave a 1 left over. That would give me x plus 1 squared plus 1. Okay, let's put it all together. This will be 9 tenths. Remember the integral in this first one is really a 1 over u du form because the top is the derivative of the bottom, which means the antiderivative should be the ln of the absolute value of the denominator minus 4 ninths times the antiderivative of 1 over x plus 1 squared plus 1. And we recognize that that's a u squared plus a squared form in the denominator. We know the antiderivative on this should be tan inverse of x plus 1. Okay, so uh, one thing I forgot to do here, don't forget that that 9 tenths is attached to the entire integral, which means it goes with both parts, this part and this part. So that means this 9 tenths definitely goes with that 4 ninths. All right, now let's go back to the original problem at the top. Let's go all the way back here. And of course, what did we do here at the bottom? We've been working on this guy. Okay, don't forget about the first part, that little integral in the beginning. That one is definitely a minus 4 fifths ln absolute value x minus 1 plus this guy, which is what we have down here, which is 9 tenths ln absolute value x squared plus 2x plus 2. And then don't forget the 9 tenths goes with that minus 4 ninths. When I multiply those, I get negative 4 tenths, which actually is negative 2 fifths, tan inverse x plus 1. Um, there are some things you could do, like combine these two logs because it's a sum, and you could use one of your log properties to combine those. Not necessary to do. But again, when you're checking the answer in the back of the book on a problem such as this, you may see terms like that combined into a single logarithm. Okay, let's look at one last example, which is the one other thing we might see happen. And we already mentioned it a little while ago. What happens if we have irreducible quadratic factors in our denominators? but they're repeated. So for example, suppose I had a rational function where the top was some p of x, and let's say the bottom contained the factor ax, plus, AX squared plus bx plus c, but raised to some integer power bigger than 1, which means there's a repetition of that irreducible quadratic. Well, again, as I mentioned before, it's the same pattern or the same trick we used when we had repeated linear factors. I would build as many partial fractions as the degree of this irreducible quadratic. So that means I would need to have a linear numerator, let's call it a sub n x plus b sub n for that irreducible quadratic raised to the nth power. I would have to have another pair of coefficients, let's call it a n minus 1 x and b n minus 1 for the next lowest power of that irreducible quadratic all the way down to, I would have to have one for the second power
of that irreducible quadratic. And then finally, I would have to have a linear, let's call it a sub 1x plus b sub 1 over that irreducible quadratic just listed to or just raised to the first power. So as an example, we're saying if we had p of x over x plus 2 cubed times ax squared plus bx plus c cubed, our partial fraction decomposition would be a over x plus 2 cubed plus b over x plus 2 squared plus c over x plus 2. That takes care of the repeated linear factor where all those numerators need to be constants. Now I take up the irreducible quadratic and we're saying there would have to be a dx plus e linear numerator for the third power of that irreducible quadratic plus an fx plus g linear numerator for the second power on that irreducible quadratic plus let's say an hx plus i linear numerator for the first power and once I reach the first power I've exhausted all the possible powers and that's as far as I need to go so this is the general pattern let's do one example to see what that would look like so I have the example of x minus 2 over x times x squared minus 4x plus 5. Now, don't put it past the author of a book like this or any other book to give you a problem like this. And depending on where it's situated in the, in the text, you might look at this and automatically think that that quadratic you see in the denominator is irreducible. It might not be. He might be tricking you and this could actually be something that's reducible. So let's check that real quick. And we can do that in our heads. Two numbers that multiply to give me 5 and add to give me 4. Well, that's, that's not going to work. The signs are wrong. That's not going to be factorable over the reals. Okay, so in that case, we're going to have one partial fraction for this x factor, which is linear plus some bx plus c linear term over x squared minus 4x plus 5 squared plus some dx plus e over x squared minus 4x plus 5 to the first. And that's what our partial fraction decomposition will look like. Again, like we've seen before, um, can I use the cover-up to at least extract one or maybe two of those A, B, C, D, E coefficients? And again, we know that for the irreducible quadratic, we can't do that. But we can do it for the linear. And of course, that means the one term or one coefficient I can figure out with cover-up is A. Again, how would that work? If I multiplied both sides of the equation by x, then what would be left on the left side would be x minus 2 over x squared minus 4x plus 5 squared. That is this. On the other side, these two terms would have x's in front of them, and this first term would have an x that would cancel out with that, which means, again, as usual, the only term that remains after I do the cover-up is the term that has that factor in the denominator. And that's the one that gets me A. What happens on the left side? Well, when I cover up the X, I just need to evaluate what's left over at the value that makes that factor equal to zero. And in this case, that's zero. Well, when I evaluate this at zero, I get minus two over five squared. Don't forget the square right there, which means A is negative 2 over 25. Okay, we've got our A. 
you know what to do now. It's the usual routine. I'm going to write that numerator from the left as something identically equal to the combined numerator when I add those three far partial fractions together. And of course that should be a times x squared minus 4x plus 5 squared plus x times bx plus c plus what's missing in this last one. Well, I'm missing the x. And I'm also missing a factor of x squared minus 4x plus 5. OK, let's clean that up a little bit. So that means x minus 2 is equivalent to a times. We might as well go ahead and multiply these two. Let's see, here's a little trick for multiplying polynomials like this that perhaps you haven't seen in algebra before. If this is a good time to bring it up. It's, it's a way of looking at polynomial multiplication that will serve us well with something we're going to do in Chapter 9. So, of course, how do I normally go about multiplying something like x squared minus 4x plus 5 times x squared minus 4x plus 5? Of course, you were taught in algebra to do this in a very systematic, regimented way, which was normally to multiply these in order the first term on the left times, in turn, each of those terms in the second factor. And then once you've exhausted the x squared with those three, you go to the minus 4x and you do it all again. And then you do the same thing for the 5, and you get nine separate products. And then you combine like terms and get your answer. Okay, the other way you can look at this that's actually a little more meaningful is think about what sorts of products you're going to get when you multiply these two polynomials. Since these two polynomials are degree 4, then the first question you could ask is, how do I get degree 4 terms? Well, there's only one way. So obviously x to the fourth. Then I could ask, what's the next lowest term? It's the cube, x cube combination. Oops, sorry. Having trouble there with my... Let's put that back. Okay, how do I get cubes? Well, I can put x squared with a first degree term. I can put x with a square term. I can't really put that 5 with anything and get a cubic term. So there are two combinations that get me cubics. There's minus 4x cubed, and there's another minus 4x cubed. That makes minus 8x cubed. How do I get x squared combinations? Well, I put x squared with a constant, or I put x with an x, or I put x squared with a constant. That means there's a 5x squared and a 16x squared and another 5x squared. That makes 26x squared. How do I get an x? Well, you can't get an x from x squared, but you could get an x from putting an x term with a constant, or a constant with, whoops, wrong thing. Getting carried away with my erasing. Or you can put a constant term with an x term. So that means there's a minus 20x and another minus 20x. That makes minus 40x. There's obviously only one way to get a constant. That's to take a constant times a constant. That gives me 25. OK, if you've seen that before, or, or even if you haven't, this is a, a way of looking at polynomial multiplication that's worth practicing and thinking about. As I mentioned, it, it will be useful for us to look at multiplying polynomials this way for something we're going to do in Chapter 9. But even for just conventional multiplication of polynomials, um, if you practice this method, it's actually quite fast and something you can do in your head. Uh, so it gives me what? Um, a x to the fourth minus 8ax cubed 
plus 26 ax squared minus 40 ax plus 25a and that takes care of all of this okay let's do the rest so of course down here we've got bx squared plus cx so bx squared plus cx and then when we come down to this last part of course that's going to be dx squared plus ex times x squared minus 4x plus 5 and of course I can see there there's going to be a dx to the fourth again how do I get cubes well there's these two and there's these two so minus 4dx cubed and plus ex cubed. How do I get squares? Well, I can do 5d squared. And it looks like I can do minus 4ex squared. How do I get x's? Well, the only way to do that would be to put an x term with a constant term. The only combination I see that would do that would be 5ex. And there isn't going to be any way for me to get just a constant term in this one with what's left there. So if I put that together with what I already had, I have a dx to the fourth. I have a minus 4dx cubed. I have a plus ex cubed. I have a 5d squared. And that should be 5dx squared. Minus 4ex squared. And then 5ex. Okay, now we have a big system there because we do need to equate coefficients. And of course, the way I've lined them up, this is similar to something we've done before. I can see that these two combine to give me a combined coefficient of a plus d for the x to the fourth term. There is no x to the fourth term on the left side of the equation. So if this was my a, b, c, d, let's say e columns, where I'm just trying to organize my variables, my parameters for my system of equations, it looks like we're saying a plus d would equal zero. Then I could look at the cubics, which would be these three. Okay, what's the cubic coefficient on the left side of the equation? Also zero. So that means I would have minus 8a minus 4d plus e which would also be 0. Next I should look at the quadratics. Oops. Okay, what's the quadratic coefficient on the left side of the equation? It's 0. So that means when I combine all those I'll have 26a plus b plus 5d minus 4e that should also be 0. Okay, now we're down to the first degree terms. And since there is a coefficient of 1 on the x term on the left side, I know that when I add up those first degree coefficients on the right side of the equation, it should be equivalent to 1. So that means minus 40a plus c plus 5e equals 1. And then, of course, at the very last there, I have my 25a. 
and I know that should be equal to the constant term on the left side of the equation, which is the minus 2. And we've seen this before. When I set that 25a equal to minus 2, immediately from that last equation, I get a equals negative 2 over 25, which of course is precisely what we got before when we used cover up. So you can either wait to find a from this system, or if you do the cover up, this is a nice check to make sure that uh, you've at least done some of your system set up correctly. Okay, let's see. What are the nice easy equations that get me something quickly? Um, that one looks pretty good. That one says if I know a, I can get d immediately. So from equation one, I can say that d is equal to negative a. So that means d is equal to 2 25ths. Okay, and in order, it looks like that second equation would be the next most useful one because that says if I know a and d, I can get e. And I just figured out d. So equation 2 says that e is equal to 8a plus 4d. So 8 times negative 2 25ths plus 4 times 2 25ths. So negative 16 25ths plus 8 25ths looks like negative 8 25ths. So e is negative 8 25ths. Okay, since I'm running out of room here, let me come up in this open space and write down what we've got so far. So a is negative 2 25ths. Uh, we've yet to figure out b or c, but we know d is positive 2 25ths, and we know e is negative 8 25ths. Okay, since I have that written down, let's get rid of this stuff. And let's see what's left. So we need B and C. And if I look at that next equation, now it's not always going to work out this way that I can just work my way from top to bottom, first equation, second equation, third equation, but in this one, it is working out that way. I'm not actually going to have to add any of these equations together to eliminate anything. In this case, when I get to that third equation, I know A, D, and E, and that would definitely get me B. So from equation 3, we could say B is equal to, let's say, negative 26A minus 5D plus 4E which would be negative 26 times negative 2 over 25 minus 5 times d, which is positive 2 over 25, plus 4 times e, which is negative 8 over 25. If I put that together, I'm going to get 52 over 25 minus 10 over 25 minus 32 over 25. So that's going to give me 52 minus 10 is 42 minus 32, 10. Which I guess we could reduce to 2 fifths. So it looks like B is 2 fifths. Okay, now if we look at equation 4, same routine. Looks like we could say that C, which is the one we want, is equal to 1 plus 40A minus 5E, which would be 1 plus 40 times negative 2 25ths minus 5 times E, which is negative 8 25ths, 
So we've got 1 minus 80 over 25 plus 40 over 25, or in other words, 1 minus 40 over 25. or in other words, minus 15 over 25, or minus 3 fifths. And it looks like we've determined all the coefficients. Okay, let's go on to the next page where I've copied this down. And of course, there's all our coefficients. There's the original partial fraction decomposition on the right side there. So of course what we want to integrate, and let's just do each one of these separately. The first one is a over x, which is negative 2 25ths over x. The second one is going to be integral bx plus c, which is 2 fifths x plus c over x squared minus 4x plus 5 squared. And then the third one is cx plus d. And apparently I miscopied that there. Let's change that. That should obviously be dx plus e. Which is 2 25ths x minus 8 25ths over x squared minus 4x plus 5. Okay, let's do that first one right away because we know that's minus 2 25ths ln x. Okay, what about this second one? Well, for that second one, if I see that square on the bottom, the first thing I think about since I see the numerator is linear and that thing inside the square in the bottom is quadratic is that if I let u equal that quadratic expression inside that square in the denominator that du would be 2x minus 4 and so this looks like the last problem we did if I manipulate that numerator correctly I can produce that du so that I can have actually a power rule because the bottom would be a u squared. So the question is how do I do that? Well let's do this like we did in the last problem. 2 fifths x minus 3 fifths over x squared minus 4x plus 5 squared. And of course what I want there in the top is a 2x minus 4. Now the last time I did this I factored out that fraction that was in front of the x, namely that one. Uh, this time, I'd really just rather keep the 2 from the 2 fifths, so I'll just take out a 1 fifth. Uh, that would be 1 fifth times 2x minus 3 over x squared minus 4x plus 5 squared. Okay, what I want though is a 2x minus 4. So, of course, to get the minus 4, I would have to subtract 1, but that also means I'd have to add 1. Okay, what does that give me? It gives me 1 fifth times 2x minus 4 over x squared minus 4x plus 5 squared plus 1 over x squared minus 4x plus 5 squared. So let me come up here and erase this and we'll say that this is equal to 1 fifth times the integral 2x minus 4 over x squared minus 4x plus 5 squared plus one-fifth integral one over x squared minus four x plus five squared. Okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. Now let's look at that last one. 
which gets much the same treatment. In fact, I see precisely that it's really the same issue. If the bottom is a u, then the du needs to be 2x minus 4. And I have the material in that numerator to do that. So of course that means I'm going to write 2 25th x minus 8 25 as 1 25th times 2x minus 8. What I really want, of course, is a 2x minus 4. So I'll write this as 1 25th times 2x minus 4 minus 4. That, of course, keeps me even with my minus 8. So that means if I have 1 25th times 2x minus 4, I'm also going to have 1 25th times minus 4 meaning I can write 2 25th x minus 8 25th over x squared minus 4x plus 5. I can write the integral of that as 1 25th integral 2x minus 4 over x squared minus 4x plus 5 plus 1 25th times integral minus 4 over x squared minus 4x plus 5. All right, now we've seen this before. What should we do when we see a constant in the numerator and we see a quadratic in the denominator? And that quadratic is only raised to the first power. The first thing we should think about doing is trying to complete the square on this quadratic in the hopes that it can be factored into the form u squared plus a squared. And as we mentioned back when we originally talked about the tan inverse form, if it can't be resolved into this form, it's going to end up being a hyperbolic tangent. But we said there was a technique in this chapter that would help us to avoid those. Well, this one is going to turn into a u squared plus a squared, so we can do it. Uh, but shortly we'll address what would happen if that quadratic did not resolve into this form. Okay, for this one, how do I complete the square? Well, x squared minus 4x, half of negative 4 is negative 2, negative 2 squared is 4, so I'd have to have a plus 4, which means there would be a plus 1. That would be x minus 2 squared plus 1. And so that's what that little denominator becomes. Let's say x minus 2 squared plus 1. So up here, this integral is 1 25th integral 2x minus 4 over x squared minus 4x plus 5 plus, or if you like, minus Four twenty-fifths. I'm taking that from right here. Integral dx over x minus two squared plus one. Where of course I recognize that's a tan inverse form with u equals x minus two and a equals one. All right, I'm going to let you finish the integration on this one and wrap up the details. Uh, but before we stop, let's just examine all these integrals and make sure we can do them. So, of course, we already did this one. Uh, can we do this one? Well, I'll just say that, as we mentioned a minute ago, this is really a du over u squared form. That's how we constructed it. Okay, what about this one? Well, same idea except this time it's not a du over u squared, it's just a du over u, which means that's a log form. Okay, this last one at the bottom, what's that one? Well, if it's u squared plus a squared in that denominator, we know this one's going to be a tan inverse form. Okay, that leaves one that I've left for last. Let's give him a special color, let's say, 
having trouble deciding here. We'll do hot pink. Okay, that one right there, we can't do yet. And I'll let you think about why. If you're looking at that, you might think about completing the square. And of course, if you do, that's going to get you this same form we have down here in this last one with the x minus 2 squared plus 1. There's only one problem. It's inside a square, which means it is not a tan inverse form. If you have the bright idea of applying partial fraction expansion to that, that is a bright idea, except you're going to take yourself in a circle. We already really did that up here with these two. And if I do that, I'll just go in a circle and get back to the same problem. So I've given you a problem here to show you the overall approach. And of course, that leads us to five different integrations. And in this one, there is one of those integrals we can't quite do yet. That's what the next section will handle. In the next section, we'll add the capability to do this one and much more. Okay, so I think I'll stop there with that example, and that completes 7.3.